In the modern era, when we have things like ChatGPT and robotic dogs running around our factories, the idea of analog robotics might sound rather quaint, like something you'd find in a 1940s sci-fi novel. But not that long ago, this was a serious area of study. This all started in the late 80s or early 90s when a guy named Mark Tilden, who was working at the Los Alamos National Laboratory at the time, designed and built some small, very capable robots that were designed to mimic living organisms, more or less. These had simple brains that were a series of inverter, buffer, uh, and or gates, stuff like that, linked up in rather unique ways with a series of resistors and capacitors to provide what they called at the time neuron nets. So each of these little inverter buffer systems that would act as a kind of an oscillator would be influenced by the other ones in the system, and you'd end up with something that could provide quite complex behavior for what was really simple parts at the time. You have to remember, at this point, microcontroller robotics was not as easy to, as it is now. It was really reserved for the kind of high-end hobbyist and things like university research groups because they were difficult to use and kind of expensive as well. So this kind of uh, resulted in a whole movement forming around it and really exploded in the late 90s and early 2000s. It became known as BEAM Robotics, which stood for biology, aesthetics, electronics, and mechanics, although there's a bit of a debate about that's the exact acronym that it stands for. This uh, really evolved into a pretty big community. Um, it had big forums and some serious interest from some of the kind of local magazines and press at the time. However, it kind of didn't live up to the hype as much as some people thought it would. These circuits, although very capable on the small scale, proved to be difficult to scale. When you got a bunch of these neurons, so-called hooked together, you would end up with some unpredictable behaviors. It was hard to model. And it was also not something you could reprogram. If it didn't have a behavior you wanted, you had to rewire your circuit, which was a lot of work. At the same time, the Arduino system was released, which became way easier to use than the microcontroller systems that had come before it. You had an integrated board that had the power management, all your pins wired up, everything basically ready to go. You didn't have to learn to have put that stuff together yourself anymore. You could just connect on your motor drivers, some sensors, spend an afternoon programming, and the next thing you know, you had a completely capable robot. This kind of dampened the interest in beam robotics, and after about 2010, it kind of died off. The interest never went away. There's still people online kind of building and maintaining some of these really cool systems, but it's not nearly what it once was. But what does it take to build one of these little robots? Well, uh, let's, uh, let's build one, and I'll show you along the way. So there's a couple different versions of the neuron nets they use. This is a very common one, and the one we'll be using for this project. So this takes a series of inverter buffers here. So these take a signal and decide if it's higher or lower than whatever the switching point is. For the chips we're going to be using, it's half of the uh, input voltage. So let's pretend this is 5 volts. It'll take this in. Whatever that is, it'll boost that up to the logic high or low, and then invert that and send it out the other way. So what you end up with is a inverter. It feeds its output through this capacitor into the input of the next, and it continues around. And then we've got this resistor here, which is an important part. So when this gets turned on, it'll initialize into some system with the outputs. Say the output of this one is positive. That means the output of this one's going to be negative. That will send a pulse of current through this capacitor and trigger this. So that'll be positive. This will be negative and you end up with a system where these are kind of opposite each other. Now, if there was no resistor here, that would be fine. You'd end up when kind of stuck in one position. But this resistor drains the capacitor charge that was driven through with the pulse through to the opposite side and slowly drops this positive down and raises this up. When that gets to the switching point, let's say it's half of the input voltage, well, suddenly, it switches these, a pulse of electricity goes through the capacitor, this becomes positive, that becomes negative, and you end up kind of in the same situation again. This discharges again when it gets to that switching point, flips around, and you end up back where you started. Now that's pretty interesting on its own, but you can do some pretty cool things with this. So we take the output here and of these two, and then we can connect that to a motor. Um, usually probably through some sort of driver system. And that will mean your motor flips 
back and forth every kind of oscillation system. And by adjusting the value of this resistor, you can make this faster or slower. Bigger resistor, it'll drain that current across there slower, and then it'll switch slower. If this is really small, it'll do that quickly. You can also vary the capacitors. Obviously, a bigger capacitor takes longer to discharge, but it's a lot easier to do the resistor because these are a lot less kind of important for that. It just needs to provide the pulse across. And this is an inverter setup up here. You can see the inverters are set like that all the way up the chip. Um, we tie the enables to ground, so that enables the trip chip. We've got these capacitors here, and then this resistor. And then we take the output of this and we couple it to all the other inverter gates on here. And that just allows us to drive a motor. So now the motor, instead of being driven off a single set of gates, is being driven off three on each side. Now, if we take the output of this here, run it through a couple of resistors and couple that into the input of another one of these, we can delay the setup or the, the oscillation period of the second kind of brain by a value based on these two resistors. So it's kind of the front motor setup will run at X ratio. So it'll look like this. And then the rear one will be slightly lagged behind based on the uh, value of our resistor coupling the two together. So the rear one will not have this resistor in place. It'll have one that connects from each of these sides in to the output of our kind of master um, setup. Now, this other ship here, what we can do is we can use these inverter gates because they have an enable setup on them. So what we do is we set it up so that normally it goes through these resistors and these resistors kind of um, set the phase shift between the front and rear legs. So this goes in here, out here normally. But when this little ship switch is closed, it charges the, this capacitor and provides a negative voltage to our enable pin, which turns on one of the half sets of inverters. So on this set, it'll do these two, which then bypasses that resistor on the top. And instead of this having a positive with a delay, it'll then get a negative with no delay coming out of that, which will reverse the kind of phasing of the two motor setups. And that'll allow us, our walker, to walk backwards. Now I have two of these set up. And that'll mean I kind of, you can see I've got just an inverter here and an inverter with a resistor here. And then I couple in this extra resistor on each side, which allows us to have kind of a bias to one side. So as this walks backwards, he'll turn a little bit, either left or right, depending on which of these, um, these setups is triggered on the front, which should allow us, at least in theory, to navigate around a busy, crowded obstacle setup. After I had the uh, circuit all planned out, I built it on the breadboard. Here you can see the front motor being set up. I just wanted to kind of get the timing roughly. And then this is the full circuit with the whole thing set up, minus the reversing circuit. This has uh, some test resistors. I'll have to balance those out later. But then I started to freeform the whole circuit. So freeforming is um, a just way of building circuits that basically solders together each component. It's very popular in Beam Robotics because you can build the circuitry into the actual kind of body of the robot. It's not a very easy or efficient way to build these things compared to a breadboard or PCB soldering, but it does look pretty cool as well. So I bent up all the circuit legs where they would kind of go and then trimmed them off and then soldered what was supposed to be together and started to build the circuit from that first chip. So I'll have to build two identical systems here but I got started with just the front one first. Since the circuitry will be kind of exposed on the top of the robot, both for ease of building, but also so you can kind of see how it works when it's done, I had to design these little circuit packs as kind of flat pieces that would sit on top. So here I'm bending out the resistors so that everything will sit flush on the top. And here you can see this is the finished package. You can see all of those buffers at the bottom join together to become the motor drivers. And then here you can see the motors. So there are a couple of servo motors which I pulled the inside um, control boards out of and I'll be driving directly off of the motors. You can modify servos like this to kind of get yourself a little gear motor. It's, uh, it's a pretty good way to get these cheap, inexpensive, uh, kind of high torque little motors. There's two two cell 
AA or AAA battery packs, which will be sandwiched on the sides and kind of keep everything in place and then power the robot. These will run off anything from like three till nine volts, but the servos are designed to run off five volts, so they'll work fine off six as well. I built kind of everything modular so it will be able to be taken apart and I can replace parts or modify it as needed. I don't think this is ever going to be serviced in any real way, but it's always good to have that ability. Once I got everything bolted together, it was kind of starting to look like something, although who knows what really. The frame will be entirely grounded, so I can power my negative rail of the electronics off of the frame, and then I don't have to worry about running individual wires to each chip. The legs were a bit tricky, but I used this piece of brass plate and then a piece of brass wire for the, uh, the legs themselves. This will be soldered together, and then I'll drill some holes through to connect the servo horn directly to the, um, to the legs. This worked out pretty well, although my little soldering iron was stressing a little bit with having to heat up this much metal in one go. There's a couple different ways to do this. Uh, I don't think this is a right or wrong way, but it worked pretty well in this case. I left the legs uh, straight at this point, and then I'll bend them into shape once they're on the robot. So I can kind of get a good idea of how everything fits together. Here I'm drilling the holes for the servo hone to bolt onto this. The leg geometry is a little bit of an art as well as a science. The general rule is that if you place your robot on an X going through the center of gravity, each line should hit on one of those Line. So kind of 45 degrees out in every direction and at roughly the same distance from the center of gravity of the robot. The easiest way I've found to do this is simply bolt it up with them straight like this and then I bend the legs into roughly the right shape. The ends will be capped with a little bit of heat shrink tubing which will allow me to have the, give it a little bit more grip than the brass rod especially if it's on something like tile or concrete flooring. Now I soldered the little brains onto the top. So this is the front motor chip. There'll be another identical one for the rear. You can see I bent up this little U-shaped piece of wire on the bottom to kind of stand it off of the body a little bit and give me a little room, bit of room to run these motor wires here. Now I just have to try everything out with some placeholder resistor values, kind of get the leg shape set up and get everything working. So it doesn't have the reversing circuit at the moment, but it does work quite well. It can get over the kind of some terrain out in my garden and get around well. I did have to add this little centering spring to the back legs underneath, so it's just a little elastic and a hook to kind of keep those centered. I then went and fitted the reversing circuitry switches and capacitors. Now that's the finished product. I had to uh, wire up a couple different resistor, resistor values. I'll put those all up on screen here, but it was pretty capable. It could get around my somewhat cluttered garage. Occasionally it would have to take a, a couple tries to kind of fully turn around when it hit something, but it was almost always able to figure it out after a while. It can also get up and over some small things about one centimeter high or so, and it walks with a pretty deliberate little gait, which is funny to see. It'd be interesting to do something like make this light seeking or something in the future, but we'll see. Well, that's it for this video. Thanks a lot for watching. This was really fun to build, um, and it was, it kind of made it me think about a lot of the kind of intricacies of how these kind of feedback systems work. And it made me think there's actually some value in these little designs. I think that this sort of system is, is quite elegant in how simple it is. I don't think it's ever going to replace the microcontroller system, but I mean, analog circuitry has made a bit of a comeback in the last few years. So maybe uh, interest in these little guys will also kind of come back. Anyway, if you build one, let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching. See you later.